Silvergate was just before them, Credit Suisse, uh, First Republic's not doing great. Um, it, it's more systemic and it, it's a fractional reserve problem and it's a liquidity problem because we're in the tightest tightening cycle in history under the most amount of debt that we've ever been under in our tools to fix inflation have not worked. Yeah, let's start with the Fed. We we had that uh, rate hike, right? It was maybe, I mean, it was pretty much what everybody expected, although some were predicting a 50 basis points hike, right? But what do you think about what the Fed is doing and what does that mean for, you know, the outlook of the economy? It's been the same since Around this time last year, I actually had a couple tweets talking about the bond positions that banks were taking and the inability for the Fed to get inflation down. So they were going yeah. to be underwater in these positions. And you'll hear from various media sources or from the banks or, or from the Fed that everything is stable and fine. And then all of a sudden, as Hobbs and I talk about every now and then on each other's tweets or in DMs, something has to break. In these banks that took all of their deposits when you were putting your money in throughout the pandemic with zero fractional reserve requirements, they bought up a lot of these positions and now they're sitting in these massive unrealized losses. Silicon Valley Bank, when they broke down, I believe it was the day after we did our last show. It was a, a very recent thing and started to break down March 10th. Um, but when they went, it was quickly... Um, discussed that this was just Silicon Valley Bank and they were heavily um, on, on the risk side of things and it wasn't a banking contagion. But since then, we've seen Signature Bank, Silvergate was just before them, Credit Suisse, uh, First Republic's not doing great. Um, it, it's more systemic and it, it's a fractional reserve problem and it's a liquidity problem because we're in the tightest tightening cycle in history under the most amount of debt that we've ever been under in our tools to fix inflation have not worked. Um, yep. At that point, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. If the Fed looks at where inflation is at at 6%, they have to continue to tighten or pull that back down to that 2% target. But if they do, banks will continue to suffer uh, under the weight of that uh, interest rate hike. Um, now, I did see an interesting breakdown. I forget which YouTube channel it was on, but they, they were just looking at the impact that the Fed has had backstopping these banks. Um, and just with the lending standards tightening at the banks without even the Fed needing to hike additionally, it correlates to about a, 150 basis points worth of tightening that the banks are just going out and deciding to do on their own. So if we were already having small businesses or different institutions struggling because they couldn't find money or lines of credit, that got extremely tight very quickly from the bank side as well as from the Fed. So I think it's not going to be long for some of those cracks to continue to break um, and we're going to be forced to deleverage uh, across the markets, in my opinion, not financial advice, but that's kind of how I've seen it playing out. And so far, we're uh, we're looking pretty good. From what I read on Silicon Valley Bank, their biggest problem was they were in long term bonds because it paid better and they didn't do proper risk management. You add in inflation and the fact that wages are going up. And I think what happened was the tech, they're majority startup tech companies and they were withdrawing their funds to pay for things a lot more quickly than they assumed they would. And because the interest rates, uh, interest rates, went up so high so quick, they were underwater on their bond portfolio and they had to take a massive loss and then a bank run happened. Uh, so it was poor management in general. I mean, mm -hmm. last summer we were talking about Tether and we were talking about stables and saying that if you don't know what term or, or how long those bond yields are, uh, there could be a huge issue if there's a bank run because they're I illiquid. You can't sell them uh, for what you bought them for when the rates are a lot higher than, than you had previously. So. Mm. Uh, it could tighten up very quickly and the market is always predisposed to go up. So unless something happens, uh, it won't, it, you know, it's not going to, it generally doesn't break until it has to. The Fed is in a tough spot. How, how much do they fight inflation? What do you, what do you think their approach is going to be? They're going to tiptoe and make it worse. In my opinion, I think yeah. they should have crashed it last summer. I think they should have pulled a Volcker because you're, your average person is hurting from inflation, from food prices. 
you know, we live in a rural area where you have to drive everywhere. Gas is going up already. It always goes up in summer, but it's already going up. Uh, they should have crashed it last year, pulled a Volker. Yeah, it would have sucked. People would have lost their jobs, but we could be in recovery. But if they tiptoe around it, I believe in 98, they got scared and cut rates and it allowed the bubble to extend until uh, the tech bubble popped. You know, and that's all, if, mm -hmm. if they do that again, we could see a melt up, make it worse. And then you got three more years after that of, of terribleness. So in my opinion, they ought to just wreck it and we should move on. But yeah, yeah. About that. yeah, it kind of feels like they are a prolonging things like they're just putting a bunch of band-aids on things uh from, from my perspective to, uh, have people lose jobs so they are yeah no. they're putting band-aids on and that's or you know it's like putting a band-aid on a dam you know it's gonna break at some point if we kind of zoom in for a second and we look at how the markets responded to the fed hike right it's been it's been positive bitcoin has been pumping and and you know the the bear uh, the bulls feel a little more excited these days where do you think we stand right now in the short term if we're looking at the crypto market in and of itself you could take uh, past indicators that help to time tops in the crypto market, not set like s full cycle tops, just any overextension in the crypto market. And there's a, a stat, I, I believe it's NTV, um, but it, it's just the amount of increase in the valuation of Bitcoin um, compared to the overall transactional volume that is occurring on the chain that tends to give it its value proposition of either being used or held or uh, traded peer to peer. And right now we're at the highest levels of overvaluation that we've ever been at because there's not a lot of volume on chain. Almost no one is using it, but you have all these massive short liquidations that are driving the price up and everyone is viewing that as like a bullish signal. So whether it was the 16K spike to 21K, most people bought it like that 21K range. I know more people that bought Cardano at 40 cents than they did at 26. And yeah. they're leaning further into this market psychology of our market. And then in traditional markets, you have um, both the NASDAQ and Fidelity launching custody platforms for cryptocurrency. But at the same time, the SEC is going after Coinbase and Binance and any impartial on and off ramp. So I, I don't inherently think that that is a good thing in the short term for the market, because the way that they view cryptocurrency in some of them, including Bitcoin from an institutional or hedge fund uh, asset manager, they view it as a speculative tech stock and they don't necessarily hold it like Fidelity was unable to hold physical Bitcoin uh, in an ETF because the SEC refused to clear it. So they're all trading. Mine it. What? I thought Fidelity mines Bitcoin. I believe that they own a decent amount of like Marathon or like Hut 8, these different mining companies. I don't know if they mine it directly themselves, but I know that they were one of like nine companies that positioned themselves to the SEC to open up a spot ETF, which for anyone listening, if you're unfamiliar what that is, it's just they would have to hold real Bitcoin in their wallets as opposed to just paper Bitcoin like we do with almost every traditional asset. Um, but the problem is they still have access to futures markets, which a simple way to think about them, you're just speculating on the price or dollar value of these assets. And they have far more money in the traditional systems. Even there, there are singular companies that are worth more than the entirety of the cryptocurrency space. So if they see the market start to unwind, they can short the crypto market on leverage into the dirt without any exposure to the asset with mm -hmm. more money than we have to counteract it. And it seems a little counterintuitive and irrational, but we're still correlated to the traditional market for that reason, because people will price an asset meant to replace the dollar in US dollars to then sell it and move back into a failing system. That's so it, it's more it, institutional investors to come in then it's going to follow the market more you know but i do want like a part of the the macro musings to focus on education and and not just like what's going on right now so i want to ask you guys a couple of questions what kind of asset <clears throat> is bitcoin uh security commodity currency everything nothing 
Um, how should we think about it? You know, as an investor, how should we think about Bitcoin and crypto as a as an investment tool, an investment asset? It's interesting. I think. Uh, I mean, it's hard. We need to really up upgrade our understanding to it. I mean, a lot of these laws that we're going off of to find out if something is security or not are so old that they really yeah. need to be updated to uh, better represent where we're at. But Bitcoin, I mean, uh, commodity is the definition. Commodities are natural or ag agricultural often, and they're finite. Well, supposedly yep. Bitcoin is finite, right? There's only going to be so much. I think the more Bitcoin does, the more likely they might be considered a security. Uh, the less it does, the more likely it's going to be a commodity still. You know, I don't see it as a currency personally. I see it as a trade. So that's my opinion on it. <clears throat> I, I would say at the moment, it's defined as a commodity. Even from Gensler back when he was teaching at MIT, he was like every other crypto is a security to, to an extent and then Bitcoin is a commodity. But I, I tend to look at things differently than, oh, what, what are the regulatory parameters? Because they've refused to define many things within this market intentionally uh, over the course of the last decade. And that includes not just traditional finance and getting into ETFs, but they go after um, crypto companies that approach them because they extend an arm. They're like, hey, come and talk to us. And then they ensnare them in these uh, legal cases or go after things that they've been doing or they've allowed for years. So I, I would say it, I look at it in two frames. One, regulation in the U.S., just like the majority of the corrupt infrastructure is also corrupt to an extent. But also, I believe Bitcoin at, at the moment is a commodity and should not be viewed in any way as a security, regardless of how they attempt to redefine it or move the goalposts. Yeah, no, I would I would totally agree with that between, you know, just looking at the characteristics of commodities versus uh, securities. And um, yeah, I mean, you could argue either, I guess, but yeah, it, it shares more characteristics with a commodity uh, at the moment. But yeah, I would actually, um, you know, I think it also shares some characteristics with a currency. So I would, it has elements of, you know, every asset class. So I would, I would argue that it basically deserves its own uh, classification. And, and we should start to think of it as, as its own asset class, because it doesn't, neatly fit into any of these and and um yeah hopefully with time people will start looking at crypto investments as more of a um i don't know sensible addition to their portfolio i've always looked at crypto from the tech perspective that's what got me into it very early on yeah. and that's why i got into cardano is i thought the tech behind it was what would be useful not a store of value you know the idea that we could run a Web3 internet, a tokenization of the internet uh, is where I see the real value, uh, tokenization of, of gaming. You know, that's that's always mm -hmm. been what I've been excited about when it comes to crypto is actually the technology. And as far as Bitcoin goes, it's kind of like the dinosaur, right? It's valuable because it was first, uh, not because it's necessarily the best. It, yeah. There's enough rich people in it that it's not going to lose value and it'll likely go up. Uh, but I, I like you know, I like chains that do stuff like they're trying to build things on on Bitcoin where you can send it. But it's you know, it's much more easy to do it on like Cardano or, or, or some of these other chains uh, than it is. Definitely. I know. On the I would, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. But I think I would add to it that the biggest value of any I mean, just just from a basic, you know, supply and demand to macroeconomics 101, you know, it's that's what determines price you know it is supply and demand so so adoption acceptance and and people basically just collectively agreeing on using something is what gives it most of its value right and that's why uh, that i guess we're so much because yeah. what if it changes like you can yes. it was open source there are so many different bitcoins out there bitcoin i remember when it was like the 2017 or 2019 no 2019 is correct 2017 2018 you had Bitcoin Diamond, you had Bitcoin Cash, you had Bitcoin Gold, mm -hmm. you had 
all these other ones. And I, I stayed out because I didn't know enough about crypto yet. I got in around 2019, but uh, like it's if you get enough money, you could get enough people to start a duplicate of Bitcoin, uh, get it on a diverse network, and then uh, what's to say they don't decide just to jump, jump ship? I think yeah. I don't think they will because enough rich people again have bought Bitcoin at this point. They won't let it die. Uh, that's always my like what if moment. That that's makes sense. Like that's why I like to do yeah. some swing trades versus hold because mm -hmm. there's always that what if like what what happens five years from now is unpredictable so the governments they obviously uh they require by law that we accept their currency it's legal tender and and so is that necessary for a currency to hold a fiat currency not backed by anything so i would argue that um that crypto is actually you know more <laughs> could be potentially be more valuable than fiat currency because you know if we have more trust in a trustless system than our government where value comes a lot from trust and use right then it could potentially be more valuable but if we globally we can't make bitcoin a legal tender is that is that necessary for bitcoin to survive i don't think so um but i also view cardano a, a little bit differently than just being hardline decentralized If we were to that state that Bitcoin's in, we wouldn't have had a multi-week long rolling conversation about contingent staking or about these fail points when it comes to decentralization. If the government went after IOHK with the full weight and power of everything they had, they, they could break most of our systems and most of us individually before we could get to the end of Voltaire and a decentralized governance system and a decentralized treasury. So although we're on the right path and we're using the right uh, model with the extended UTXO, we're not fully decentralized yet. And a lot of these crypto companies or blockchain um, L1s, they're not either. So Bitcoin in its own sense is our backstop within the market. If it ceased to exist, then they're killing our market that week. It's over. If Bitcoin failed, then oh, go after the companies and the people that create these because there's a start point. It was so early and it got so distributed and so decentralized that by the time the government really started to care around Silk Road around 2012, 2013, they couldn't even break it down back then. Yeah, I, um, I'd almost disagree that it is decentralized because don't like how many mining groups make up Bitcoin mining? I think there's like three of them that make up a majority of the like people donate their their mining power to these groups. But the groups themselves have power because I think three of them make up a majority of the mining of Bitcoin. At the end of the day, we're humans. Right. And there's always going to be some sort of a power concentration. Right. Even in a uh Like there's going to be an economy, people with more uh, resources and power. So how can we achieve a truly decentralized system? And if you if you look up the current Bitcoin hash rate, um, and this is after over the past year, two years, uh, China, the largest, most pop populous country that was doing the most amount of mining bans it. And they're destroying miners in the street and they force everyone underground or out of their country And yet the Bitcoin hash rate for miners is higher than it's ever been. It's um, almost like whack-a-mole in a sense where you can break up these mining groups, which are still constituted of their own individual miners. They're just coming together to try and amplify the rewards. But countries uh, out of necessity, um, whether it's El Salvador making it legal tender and attempting to mine Bitcoin via their volcano system, which is still kind of fucking metal, if you ask me, um, or when it comes We down need to do to, that in Iceland, man. Yeah. Got plenty like, of volcanoes. It, it, there, there's 95 percent of the world has been struggling in perpetuity with the current U.S. dollar world reserve system that we have. And that opportunity will continue to find pockets of the world that they've lost regardless. So that risk that they take on, although it is a risk, it's their only direction that they can go without pressing their currency into hyperinflation or sliding further into destitution. Um, the same thing goes for individuals, since you can travel anywhere in the world and go to a country that might not have a cryptocurrency capital gains tax. Or you may find yourself in a place that they ban it, but then you throw on a VPN and you send it regardless because it's peer-to-peer -peer and they can't stop it. 
So the harder they tend to press on regulation, the stronger the hash rate gets. Um, that that's like the difference between being able to break a decentral uh, decentralized network or have it be um, fully, I, I would say, anti fragile. Because right now, even with Cardano, you're right. We have 3,100, 3,200 stake pool operators all over the world creating stuff, but. We, we still have massive um, hurdles to put in place, and that includes governance and making decisions collectively, which is a hot button topic. Decentralizing the treasury that Charles actually had a full uh, conversation about that in how it works with the Cardano community about a, a week ago. Yeah, um, listening to that. Yeah, I think it's still available uh, if you want to yeah, listen to it back. You yeah, had a great was, question on there. So <laughs> recorded. Yeah. Um, but but to get to those points, um, we still rely on the introduction and completion of Hydra and Mithril, and we still rely on IOHK and that directional leadership at the moment. Now, could we just have that completely fail and take it up and try and bootstrap it just people? It, you could. Um, it's just very difficult. So we're under the, the shot clock right now to try and finish what we need to do and do it correctly um because they're putting bad regulation and breaking off ramps and on ramps um all these different things that might make it hard for people in the u.s to participate if they decide mm -hmm. to go that route yeah so i'm still looking into mining i was curious i used to mine crypto and bitcoin could be 51 percent attacked uh really you, know, you you can if you guys want to share anything on your screen by the way you should be able to to do that but um yeah what are you what are you seeing hops I'm just saying, like, say a government, like everybody is excited that China wants to be a hub. Like how many billions of dollars have we sent Ukraine for help? It would only take $10 billion worth of equipment to 51% attack Bitcoin right now. I think that, I mean, it's so if it became popular or, or if it like, unless it got much, much higher transactions, if a government really wanted to F with people, they could easily... Mm -hmm build something but, to attack bitcoin i guess but here's the question does government does the government um i mean obviously i well maybe it's not obvious what does the government think about uh crypto um uh, because i feel like i'm i'm getting different answers uh from different people do they want to kill it do they want to you, you know benefit from it uh not sure the u.s government is the like if you're worried more about like hackers or a 51 percent attack or stuff like that you know i think north north korea is probably one of the major hackers of uh it's usually bridges i believe where they steal money i don't know mm -hmm. anybody would want to do anything as overt as a 51 percent attack on bitcoin because they can do other hacks that get them lots of money but i mean i'm not sure the u.s if you're looking from a a hacker's standpoint i think you'd be worried about other countries it's more the on roads uh vivo was saying that you'd have to worry about with the u.s to me it's it's the loss of control i think kundi is is uh pointing at that in the comments it's a you know not having control because people are accepting uh bitcoin now as a store of value currency whatever you want to call it um not just their legal tender, which they have absolute control over uh, the supply and, and regulation. So, yeah, Viva, what do you think about that? So you it's not just owning a lot of Bitcoin. You have to own 51 percent of the mining hashing power to 51 percent attack it. So that that's much, much more difficult because we we have the money or we could just print the money if we wanted to to go in and buy the assets itself but it's the actual proof of work network that is spread out all over the world that you you would need it's such an immense amount of additional power and infrastructure and mining equipment uh to 51 percent attack it at this point plus i i feel if the governments truly take that stance of we want to break this technology because it's a direct competitor to the dollar or it is a threat to our power and control, they would have done it when Bitcoin was a fraction of the size back in 2013, 2014. The New York attorney general is trying to ban it in the state of New York and then 2016, 17, all these major hacks and they're sitting there trying to figure it out. I, I think that they would have done it when Bitcoin was younger 
um, in less distributed and less decentralized um, it, compared to now when it's probably at its most decentralized it's ever been based on hash rate. That, that's just my outlook. I, I mean, I, I think there's a better chance of us slipping into a global conflict with the East and the West, the BRICS nations and the U.S. fighting over the U.S. dollar. And we lean more into that military industrial complex aspect that the U.S. has prepared to maintain that dominance, regardless of whether or not it made sense for people. Yeah, I don't know that it's that big a deal that governments actually care. I'm just saying it is something that could be sold to people as decentralized and yet controlled still. We've seen how much um, how much people leveraged on top of leverage on top of leverage just to get it to where it was, which is the same thing as the stock market did in 08, right? They repackaged and repackaged and repackaged to to get these insane valuations and then had it had it pop. So I guess my outlook is it, that's why I think of it as a trade, right? Like uh, I'll trade it. I don't know that I'll own it long term unless it just keeps going up. And then I would continue to swing trade it, I guess. But I do that with stocks, too. So that's just like a personal preference. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention the Nakamoto coefficient. I'm sure you guys have, have heard of that. Um, I've never seen that, that number for, for Cardano, for example. The Nakamoto coefficient, I, I think, is not a ridiculous metric, but it, at least in my outlook, the only value proposition of cryptocurrency, not a blockchain, because there's a million value propositions of blockchain, but the only value proposition of cryptocurrency is true decentralization. And I, I firmly believe the only one that is to that point that, that's fully distributed, no one's in charge, everyone makes decisions collectively around the world based on proof of work or um, interacting with the network, that's Bitcoin. So every other cryptocurrency that's trying to get there, um, I, I, I think it's irrelevant. It's either it, it is decentralized or it's not. And, it, and that's just a battle we have to fight staring at the mm. metric that, that someone else has. It's just like an interim. We saw Credit Suisse being being kind of taken over and, and basically bailed out, right? What do you guys think about government bailouts of these banks? Are more coming? Is it a good thing, bad thing? It's interesting. It depends on what they'll do with the money. Do you know what the interest rates they were charged on those loans were, Viva? Um, I, I know that they were loans. I do not know the rates that they were charged. But the, the concern is, one, people view that already incorrectly as a form of injecting money into the system. And I yeah. see people talking about like, oh, you know, the Fed hasn't pivoted, but look at these hundreds of billions being shot into the system. That isn't quantitative easing to stimulate the economy. That is money being created in the form of debt to back up unrealized losses in liquidated insolvent banks. That That is not a healthy thing for the markets, no matter which way you cut it. Mm -hmm. um, but the money that's being created, let's say that they're lending to First Republic, um, we'll, we'll use that bank as an example. And JP Morgan gives them $30 billion and um, the Fed sends them some additional billions. And especially from the Fed, these are one year loans. So they have to begin to pay them back. The main uh, revenue driving aspect of a bank is having their deposits, offloading them because they view it as a liability. Because if I'm a bank and you give me money, then I have to pay you, even if it's insultingly low, I still have to pay you a small amount of interest on that money, even at 0.01%. So it's a liability to me to hold that on my balance sheet. So that's when even Silicon Valley Bank, they put it in all these long bond positions at like 1.7, 1.8% um, return when inflation's at 7, 6%. Um, that's why they're they're underwater. So the Fed's creating this backstop for the banks. And now they're saying, OK, here's your loan. You have to pay us back in a year. But those banks just had a massive exodus of their depositors. Mm -hmm. So now you don't have deposits in your bank to offload into other positions to earn money, not only as your business model, but to pay this loan back. So as those loans start to come due, they're not going to be able to pay them. And that's when we shift from a liquidity crisis into a full blown debt crisis, because yep. it's just nothing but debt and no one has any other solution other than create more debt to pay the interest on the debt. How 
is the crypto market going to react to a complete meltdown in the traditional markets? Depends on if we still have electricity or not. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I you could, if it's a slow die, like say things slowly die over a decade or more and you can see it coming, it's not instantaneous, you know it's coming, then yeah, maybe Bitcoin will do all right. But uh, if it's, usually people push things off and majority of people don't see it until it's too late. And uh, I think if it got as bad as people say it's going to get and you had hyperinflation in like America and the West and other developed nations, you know, that makes people angry. When people get angry, they start wars. When wars happen, they go for power. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, you have to have power to run Bitcoin. Uh, if it if it's me personally, maybe I'm just too old. I, I'd rather have assets that I have at home for trading if the worst ever happened. But I don't think I don't think the worst will probably happen. So I think Bitcoin will continue to gain in value. And you'll see some of the major currencies play less of a of a major role. Yeah, that's that's definitely the doomsday scenario. But there's also the scenario of uh, you know just basically uh, 2008 happening again, something similar. Um, and and how I, we didn't really have, uh, we, well, we did not have Bitcoin in 2008. So um, how will it react in a similar situation, Viva? So although we didn't have Bitcoin in 2008, we didn't solve any of the problems from 2008 throughout traditional finance to begin with. So we're reliving the same issues that we have printed more debt into to continue to kick that can down the road over and over again. So we're we're in that same scenario currently. This is we're currently in a period where this is 2008 part two times 10. Um, that that's what's unfolding. And it's across everything from like corporate real estate to normal real estate to the US dollar strength to inflation. When it comes to Bitcoin and hyperinflation, one this take that's up on, on the screen, the hyperinflation is a bullshit take. Um, I, I think it's irresponsible for the ex-CTO of Coinbase, who's currently in litigation or preparing for a lawsuit with the SEC, to come out and say that everything's going to fail in 90 days. Because if this scenario happens, we're all going to shut our laptops and you're going to have to worry about physical conflict in front of your house because... The entire yeah, system yeah. breaks. You're not going to be able to find food. Your utilities are going to shut off. This would kill all of us. I just so, can't believe someone like that is is basically well. But I was going to say cashing in on on his entire reputation. But the sad thing is there are, there aren't going to be any repercussions because people on social media are probably going to forget about this pretty soon. And I I think his take though is playing into the same aspect that people look at like oh how do we think the government's going to regulate things. He's looking at it like right now the system should fail in its entirety, right? Are we, are we really going to backstop $18 trillion worth of failing deposits? Should the banking system go? Is that going to rip inflation higher? Is the Fed going to break down because they were incorrect? Um, but you're not factoring in the level <clears throat> of corruption and global collusion from the, the top that it staves off some of these problems. So although they're reckless, I don't believe that they're stupid um, from the Fed to the banks, to the World Bank, to the World Economic Forum, to politicians. They're, they're corrupt, but they're not idiots. So it's not just all going to implode. We still have the ability and what I think is going to happen in my non-financial advice opinion is we have to deleverage a bit and these banks are going to continue to get hit. And since they're tightening their lending standards on their own, um, it's going to drive the market into a, a little bit of a free fall as we get towards the summer. Um, now, if something happens in between now and then, then sure, I, I pivoted my date from February to June, um, but I didn't change my outlook. It's more so just a timing thing. Um, but if the banks start to unwind and unemployment, when those reports come back out, starts to skyrocket because there's we're not adding 500,000 jobs at the lowest unemployment uh, employment rate ever like large companies disney just announced yesterday they had their uh first round of three layoffs of seven thousand employees in round one yeah facebook um, so, is, is in round two with ten thousand employees i think the other day. The yeah it goes up <laughs> yeah so, so like at this point we're, we're just getting to that stage as things break and the fed only has one solution 
And that is to, okay, shit's hitting the fan, unemployment's up. Now we're going to genuinely shift into quantitative easing or we're going to make uh, the money printer go burr. But just like COVID was an extreme amount of money printing, then followed by an extremely aggressive tightening cycle. When mm -hmm. we respond to this, because that can we kick down the road is so big and it's mm -hmm. so heavy. We're going to have to print so much that we're going to break our leg kicking that can. That's when you have your melt up. And we're already putting in place the rails for a CBDC that I think is going to be the solution that every desperate, displaced, debased uh, person in the country is going to have to take because they have to pay for the rent or they're deep underwater in bills and they're paying for things on credit. Um, have you guys had a a long, deep conversation with a bull? What are their main arguments? Every article I read from a bullish standpoint, uh, it's based on nothing breaking, right? Nothing breaking, yeah. employment stays tight, inflation melts away, people, uh, the consumer holds up somehow and doesn't lose money. And we, and I mean, even the bullish, the most bullish case I've read so far is the S&P at 4,600 which I think is another what, 16, 17% from here. That's like the most bullish case I've read, but it mm -hmm. is it's based on absolutely nothing breaking. And, but what they're doing, like Viva said, they're, they're kicking the can down the road. So maybe, maybe they can kick it far enough to get people comfortable enough. And we do get a small melt up here. Uh, but at some point there, there, there will be a reckoning and, you know, with companies laying people off, uh, money and banks making lending tighter, we're going to see, I think, that final capitulation before we can really, I mean, I don't hear anybody say, oh, things are great. They say, oh, we don't think things are going to break yet. You know, uh, yeah. the, the conversations I'm hearing are are far different than they were, you know, a few years ago. A few years ago, you talk about which stock you're going to buy. And now they're talking only about TA charts, levels, and whether something is going to break or not. So uh, the conversation's completely changed, which tells me everybody's a bit on edge. They're just trying to make what they can before it breaks. That, that's kind of the... Yeah. Uh, so it's basically like everything is fine. Um, like the, the, these big issues, they're just kind of going to resolve themselves or not something to worry about right now. Correct. And who knows? Maybe, you know, it's, it's been a weird couple of years. Maybe maybe I'll be wrong and it will all just resolve itself and we'll go back to rosy, you know, yeah. days. Of, Hopefully. Of I honestly hope so. I honestly hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I do too. I'd love to make money again. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, it just doesn't seem, with all the things going on, uh, with all the world's picking side or all the countries picking sides, you know, we're going to have to pull it. I think they played their hand too early personally. Uh, because of COVID, but now a lot of the West are pulling manufacturing back, which will, you know, weigh on inflation. It costs more to manufacture things here than it did overseas. You already see people transitioning their manufacturing out of China, which will just, you know, exacerbate the issues we already have going on. So um, I just don't see it happening, but I will admit that it's been a crazy couple of years and maybe, maybe we'll get lucky. You know, anything to add to that, Viva? Oh, yeah. So I, I agree with what Kundi said down there in the chat. So in our ecosystem or in our vacuum of cryptocurrency, um, the bulls and I hate the term bears and bulls. I, I think it's ridiculous, um, but uh, they are it's looking to, it's to simplify things. We like black and white, right? Yeah. But they're they're looking at the crypto market in, in a vacuum. And they're saying, oh, we've entered this free having cycle and we're going to go up and look at this logarithmic rainbow chart of it only going up. And I get that. Mm -hmm. However, you've never had a period of either the Fed or the global economy tightening. That, crypto that is that is the bigger. It's it's worth stopping there for a second. There's a reason yeah. why I mentioned earlier we didn't have Bitcoin in in 2008, right? Like we have never, like we have never experienced this in the in the crypto space, right? We have never, like we have very limited data, um, in the space. Yeah. yeah, and if you think about the, you were saying simplify it. If you want to imagine the economy is you're sitting on a beach 
and you see all of the water start to recede and it just keeps pulling out and pulling out. That's the liquidity right now. It's being sucked out of the system at a faster pace and more aggressively than ever before, which is why it irritates me when I see people in like the CNFT space or on Cardano, they're like, oh, we're, someone stole our liquidity. There is no liquidity across any system currently. But then whenever I'm looking at traditional macro economists and hedge funds and everyone else, every long term bull or builder from the tech side for Web3 had their entire savings and company explode with Silicon Valley Bank or Signature Bank to, to say that these are, are the experts and here's what's happening and here's what's stable. They have been systematically wrong. The Fed was saying, oh, you know, inflation's transitory. They were wrong. It's, it's not a matter of here is how the way that things work and we have control over the system because that's what they're used to. Now it is here is the way things are supposed to work and we don't have control of anything, but we cannot depict that to the broader population because we are at a risk of a global bank run if people start to panic because we do not have the money to back it up. FDIC is like one one hundredth of the overall dollars that are in the banking system just in the US. We we can't back that up. So it, yeah, it's 19.6 trillion deposits in America and nine trillion of them are uninsured. During this period of 2023 Q1, the majority of smart money, big money, they were selling and it, we're at the highest sustained sell pressure in traditional markets that we've been at since 2008. So even as the mm. market's going up, we have an increase up to an all time high of the daily retail money that they're putting in, which peaked at one point five billion dollars per day. And then smart money and institutions are attempting to get their funds out. And at the same time, everyone is now pulling their deposits from banks, either to pay for the cost of living, to support their business in a time of inflation, or because they know that after five, six bank collapses, we're getting to the point where now we are at risk as well. So a, a lot of experts, a lot of uh, accredited advisors have been chronically wrong every single step of the way. So it's not a matter of like a soft landing because we do not have a solution for that. We have two solutions. We tighten or we ease. And in either case, we either debase the population because they can't afford anything or we suffocate the banking system that's already visibly collapsing. Those are our only two solutions other than a CBDC, which they're launching Fed now is the base layer of that in July. And I think they moved that back to June, which is odd because it kind of coincides what I think will be the bottom um, or global conflict, which everyone's already gearing up, both not only choosing sides when it comes to BRICS and what currency or physical backing they're going to have, but also the early tensions between Russia, the Ukraine, and by extension, NATO, China, and Taiwan, and their ability to take back that. And the U.S. wants those semiconductors, them threatening the power of the U.S. dollar as a world reserve or an intermediary. The, the groundwork is set for that as well. So it's either we crash, we crash, global conflict, or dystopian CBDC. And, and here's, here's the last thing I'll say. I am eternally bullish on decentralized solutions, and that's why I'm here. But I am not uh, naive to say that that transition occurs in a year. That's going to be an adoption curve. Not that it couldn't happen overnight, because we do have the tech. And I've heard people say, like, hey, technology is better. Adoption curves are, are faster. But when you do it at a time of globalization where everything's tied to the dollar and we don't have infrastructure in a lot of the places in the world that need it, it's still going to take some time. Yeah. Um, in the short term, traditional finance, that that's just my outlook. And I'm, I'm digging for data or anything to, to counter it. When you're looking at volatility in the market, a lot of people are trading single day options because we started this whole Wall Street bet retail um, mess where oh, almost 50% of daily volume is coming from single day options. So the VIX are a volatility index to show whether or not the market's healthy or if things are getting a little volatile has been deeply incorrect. But this chart mm. is for the bond index uh, referred to as uh, move. Yeah. So that's, that is the volatility index. And despite mm -hmm. even the banks collapsing, it seems pretty subdued because we have all of yeah. these one day options skewing it. But if you look up um, 
move. This is the bond market volatility index. So where I assume a lot of these systems break or what forces other systems into this capitulation is the bond in the debt market. In 2022, whether it was risk on or risk off assets, we had collectively the worst year pretty much in history uh, when, when it comes to these assets. So you have extreme volatility in the debt market and the bond markets, and they're significantly larger than the entirety of the stock market and crypto combined. Um, it, but people are looking at like a single green volume, low volume day candle on Bitcoin. And they're saying it's the having and we're going to new all time highs. I, I don't believe that that's correct. Um, and this plays into why the banks are currently failing. And there was one additional one I wanted to show you further down in the thread. So when COVID hit, we have fractional reserve requirements where if I deposit my money into a bank, despite them viewing it as a liability, they have to keep a certain amount of funds on their balance sheet to support depositors. And when COVID hit, we dropped that uh, requirement of what people needed to keep on their balance sheet to zero. Um, now, you could say it was an emergency in that moment. Um, but then again, when we removed ourselves from the gold standard in 1971, it wasn't supposed to be a permanent shift. It was supposed to be a temporary fix True. that we were supposed to reinstitute that um, soon after paying off our debts. And we never did. So when we dropped this to zero, all of the banks that are currently at risk or the ones that have already failed, this is a catalyst as to why. Not only did inflation push them underwater, but they had zero accountability when it came to holding deposits on their balance sheet. So the maximum amount of your money is in these underwater positions that they could possibly afford. And they were buying them at all time high volumes. Um, well, so I just wanted to highlight that. Something else that's a big problem now that wasn't a problem in 2008 is a lot in 2008, I didn't have a phone with a bank account on it where I can easily transfer my funds, set up a new account and get my funds transferred instantaneously. It's going to make a bank run so much easier today, uh, especially with these underwater bond report uh, portfolios because they don't have the liquidity. And to get the liquidity, they're going to have to sell them at a loss. Um, yeah, I think what it was a couple billion at least they sold that bond portfolio at a loss on SVB. So the, the technology is going to make a bank run worse today than it would be in 08, simply because people can move their money with the click of a button. Yeah, bank runs don't look like this anymore. When the halving begins to approach, and a lot of people are looking at this 2011, 2013, 2017, 2021, now 2024, or all the cycles next to each other. And here's this logarithmic path upward. So it's programmed and we're going to go up supply and demand Bitcoin having in 392 days. Like I, I get that. But if you look at the last bear cycle leading up to the having in May of 2021, the best time that you could have bought anything, including all coins and Bitcoin was the COVID flash crash due to a black swan event in traditional finance and just in the world in general. Which and I that was two, <laughs> two months before the having occurred. And no one was really pricing that in. Like there were a couple people that were following the news and I was looking at that and waiting for things to break down. I didn't anticipate a global shutdown um, and, and never returning to normal, but you could tell um, even again in the debt and the bond market in 2019, inverted yield curve every single time there's a problem and the economy is unhealthy and we need to unwind. And then with COVID as a catalyst, the whole thing just disintegrated and Bitcoin fell to like 3,600. Cardano was down to like three cents, I think, for a day or two. So just because we're approaching the halving doesn't mean that these large one-off black swan events, global conflict, a, a full banking crisis that we can't print or bail our way out of, uh, global populations and world government shifting away from the U.S. dollar, more internet and access and conversation around the potency of decentralization as a disruptive technology. All of those things are factoring into uh, really where the value's at, and they're trying to position themselves as well. I think if any of those events play out, we're going to get a cheaper entry 
But I would imagine that this coming bull cycle, if you want to call it that, because traditional finance is going to be melting down, melting up, it's going to be super volatile. It's probably the last chance that people are going to have to make a life changing wealth because you have this curve of diminishing returns. Yeah. The more people that come into the market and participate, the less returns you're going to get as opposed to a 400,000% return on Bitcoin when you were buying it back in 2011. Um, now, if Bitcoin, I, I think, tripled, right? It went from 20K at mm -hmm. the last all time high to 69K. Well, that's that a good all, thing, in my opinion. Well, it, it, yeah, it's it's just a natural law natural. That, yep. that, that adoption has to follow. So when you're investing in these different positions, anyone that's like, Every YouTuber that comes out and they just do price prediction videos, they're like Bitcoin to 500,000. It's not really based on anything other than either them attempting to get views. Everyone was wrong about that throughout the entirety of 2021, 2020, 2019. That doesn't mean the value can't go up. It's just not enough to alter your overall state of living or put everyone in retirement. So this they're going to have to start covering some other cryptocurrencies. Uh, honestly, they're they're going to be in a tough spot because everybody wants to hear about Bitcoin, but uh, they can't do those five hundred x hundred x thumbnails anymore. I, I think that when we have that cycle, that's going to be the adoption curve for a lot of individuals and countries that no longer trust either their government or the banking system. It's not going to be a narrative of does the U.S from a regulatory standpoint, allow it, or is China moving back to Bitcoin mining? It's just the world is collectively establishing this hash rate. The world and people in every country on earth utilize that system. And whatever side they choose to also participate in or that allows them to be there, then that's just an underpinning of value that is finite and accountable and transparent that they can take advantage of. We're into greed. You know, we've been pretty neutral for a while and, you know, during the crisis, maybe went a little bit uh, fear uh, towards fear. But, yeah, I, this is what I'm sensing. Like people are um, this is what I'm seeing, you know, like top stories, Bitcoin up above 28K. We're we're back in the bull cycle. Things are good. Uh, we're going to be we're back to making money. You know, since this is a uh, non financial advice, I do tell people to always do their own research. You know, I mean, there's always the chance that I'm too bearish or I'm wrong. I mean, the, the, the things we're stating are facts, right? We're, we're stating facts of what's going on, but maybe somehow it works itself out to where our views don't happen and it, and it does continue on. So I would encourage people uh, to do their own research. If I still had my job and I wasn't a stay-at-home dad, I would have been piling into cryptocurrency the whole way down. Uh, but because I, I sold near the top, and my family uses that savings because inflation has gone insanely mm -hmm. high. You know, I, I can't risk, I can't take as much risk as I used to. You know, that's why I do more swing trades now. So I don't see a way we don't crash down and at least test the lows. Uh, but that doesn't mean I couldn't be wrong. We all could be wrong. That's the thing. And we all are in different situations. So like that, what's best for me is not going to be best for you, Hops, and, and it's not going to be best for you, Viva, and and so on, because we're all in. So even, even if you hear me say something, this is what I'm doing. I am not saying this is what you should be doing. That's And obviously, let's say it again, nothing on this show is financial advice. Do your own research. Let's imagine, and again, not financial advice, but let me uh, ask you a hypothetical question of what you would do if you would find yourself now in a situation where you are heavily invested in crypto, uh, maybe some NFTs, and you are excited about you know the bull run maybe being back on or or not sure what's going on. What like how would you how would you approach uh, the next few months? Good question. So um, the, the majority of my personal wealth um, is within the crypto market. And I, I still have money outside on the sidelines waiting for uh, the bottom that I'm looking for. But if the market reversed and just went up and I was wrong or we manipulated to that point, then that's fine. I'm also done and I retire and everyone can give me shit because I, I don't <laughs> care. Um, <Yeah. laughs> if, if something insane happens that you can't anticipate, then so be it. But um, what I would do 
personally now and what I'm focused on is the same thing. I'm not sure if I mentioned it in the last show or not, but my outlook, even coming back from CNFT con last October was I, I see a shift from the NFT space into Cardano native DeFi, DeFi just as an yeah. example. Um, mm -hmm. Because we had Vassal, we had Jed and Shen coming up and a stablecoin network being established between them and IUSD. So I sold just like a handful of NFTs. I don't want to destroy my entire portfolio. But at that same time, we're at the all time high single volume day in CNFT and people are FOMOing into projects they already have a big holding of at three times the price saying, hey, jump on before you miss the train. And instead, I'm like, let me exit uh, like 0.1% of my NFT portfolio and mm -hmm. buy into some of this important uh, ADA native infrastructure. Because although it's much riskier to go into smaller companies or micro or low cap uh, altcoins, if I have conviction that Cardano will succeed as a layer one, then by extension, I have to have some conviction that the ecosystem and DeFi and the infrastructure built on top of it will succeed as well. And instead of yeah. purchasing Cardano at 40 cents at a $8 billion market cap or whatever it was at, um, I could purchase different tokens or things that I find value in at a $2 million market cap or, you know, a, a $500,000 market cap. They're, they're incredibly low because there was no focus. And that's where most people are fighting over floors in the CNFT space. And personally, I, I did, uh, what, six 10Xs, two 20Xs and a 40X in that DeFi market just by paying attention to it and understanding what's going to be available or where that liquidity is going to shift. And there's no argument that you can make where there's a better ROI in a different portion of the Cardano ecosystem at the moment than that. Um, but of course, I, I've spent since 2020 preparing to shift over into Cardano DeFi. Most of their ERC-20 tokens before it was available, I researched all of them. Like I've put a lot of time and preparation into it. I do not treat it like a shitcoin casino that you see people do on like Binance Smart Chain or just mm -hmm. that DeFi boom and you buy everything. Like I, I really try and make sure that whatever positions I take are long-term holds and I make enough calculated um, unbiased decision-making when, when I allocate uh, my ADA there. Oh, you haven't mostly been buying Hosky tokens is what you're saying. <laughs> so I, I swear I, I was the first person in that Hosky bowl back in, uh, I, I think it was uh -huh. like the first day in November, 2021. Yeah. Good times. Um, I remember I, I was two, two eight up per and you're getting like a billion Hosky token. Yeah. I stayed up all night, just hitting that, that bowl. Um, so I, I wouldn't purchase any of it now, but I still have my Hosky and, you know, I, I love what they're doing. I, I think that when you when your marketing tactic is we're worthless and we're going to zero, then you have no expectations that you can fail people on because they, their only yeah. expectation is zero to begin with. That's the brilliance of it. And now they're kind of building value in the background, trying to be not too obvious about it because it goes against their branding. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, looking at the, both the seven day and the one month change in the total value locked category here on Cardano, Minswap 34%, Indigo 32%, Jed, obviously, uh, new, I mean, it's pretty much across the board here. Uh, and we're in the top 20 now as a chain, which we have, haven't really been. And I think we are reaching like all time high levels here in D5. Do you think, is it too late then? Like, aren't you just chasing the top now? Too late to get into Cardano DeFi? No, um, <laughs> I, I I don't believe that. Now you will have cycles where yeah. uh, over, I, I think it was about two, three weeks ago, we kind of topped out as far as that, like I, it was almost a catalyst from AGIX in AI tech in general that sparked off an additional big push for Cardano DeFi, and then it's going to cool down a bit, and they're they're going to sell off a bit, and then continue to build out. But if you look at it in terms of even what Ethereum's DeFi was doing last bull run, we're we're kind of where Ethereum was in late 2019, early 2020. 
not mm -hmm. from like a base layer concept technology standpoint, because Cardano has different ways to scale and secure the, the network. But from a DeFi perspective, I see that we're kind of around like 2019, 2020. Some of their protocols, whether it be Aave, Compound, Curve Finance, Synthetics, a lot of their different um, applications became multi-billion dollar market cap tokens. And much of Cardano DeFi, because it's all broken down in uh, on tap tools in ADA valuation for fully diluted market cap, which just takes into account every mm. token distributed or not. Um, we're on average at like a $10 million market cap, a $5 million market cap. Um, the room for growth there is exponential if they succeed. And my way of going, quote unquote, long on ADA, because I, I don't like leveraging up and just purchasing that, is to bet on the budding ecosystem that Cardano will enable. Uh, built on top of it. Probably one of the biggest stories, I guess, in the in the crypto space for the past few days is the Binance lawsuit. Have you guys looked into that at all? What do you think the outcome is going to be? I think uh, the most interesting article I read about it suggests that the Fed had insiders at Binance, and that's how they got some of these signal app mass messages to interesting uh, because they were they were told to have it on auto delete. You know, and I think signals all what encrypted information, right? So the article I read suggested that the feds actually have insiders in it. Now, how much they'll be able to do, uh, America alone wouldn't be able to shut down Binance. We already don't allow it. But uh, if enough countries uh, crack down on it, it could get interesting. Yeah. I, I would agree. I, I think to go in tandem with this, not only are they, they going after... Binance at the same time, the NASDAQ is setting up a crypto custody uh, platform in the US being hypocritical because it's not about custody. It's about are you allowed as an individual to custody your assets or to access them or participate in that trade? Um, but also just yesterday, uh, Gary Gensler was uh, set to now testify in front of Congress on his outlook and his actions in cryptocurrency. I believe that's coming up on the 18th of April, something like that. So they have him scheduled to testify in front of con uh, Congress. Bad actors and bad regulations and corruption cannot be discounted when you're taking into account the decisions that they make. And it's not a tinfoil hat thing because typically when you get into these discussions, it, it becomes, oh, well, that's obviously not going to happen because we trust the governments and we trust the banks and we trust the Fed. And you look at everything that has played out, even in the short term over the last three years, and you have nothing to support that argument that they should be trusted or that they're acting authentically or that they care about protecting consumers, either the CFTC or the SEC. Like they, every action that they've taken tends to work against them. And I even yeah. shared a, a post, even down to when it comes to paying taxes, that the more impoverished your county is that you live in in the U.S., the higher uh, st statistical chance that you have of being audited again or audited multiple times. So a lot of it is just how, how can we break the backs of the population? And that's our way to take control. So they attack those. Control. those all exactly. There are so many crypto people that got worked over as well. You know, I know that the government doesn't necessarily care either, but I don't like to paint crypto as this beautiful, huge, great thing that everybody's out there just to help everybody else. I mean, look at how much corrupt uh, there is false trading to promote volumes to get people to buy and so much leverage that I would like to think that, you know, that we could get past that and make it better. But you also have to be aware of how much of uh, how much corruptness there is in, in crypto itself as well. So you don't get taken uh, on both sides of the coin. Yep. A uh, couple of other headlines here. Safe Moon was compromised. Uh, Safe Moon, not so safe after all, I guess. Poly uh, so they released uh, the, the scaling solution here, ZKEVM. Uh, and uh, Vitalik was the one who did the first transaction. Yeah, we covered this. Elon talking about AI. Everybody's talking about AI. I saw Jack in the in the chat earlier. He's talking a lot about AI, and and I've been thinking. I mean, every yeah, everyone 
is talking about AI. I've been thinking about how I can have AI help me with my newsletter, content creation, like how can we use AI uh, to improve our lives? I don't know about this though. It's hard to really wrap your head around the fact that Microsoft, two months after ChatGPT becomes a thing that's public, they purchased them for $10 billion. Um, so they obviously see the benefit in this. I don't think that AI poses a risk so quickly that people anticipate, like everyone thinks pop culture, Skynet, Terminator-like esque things. But my broader concern when it comes to AI is anything that doesn't involve subjectivity or human interaction and the emotion behind it that we make our decisions based on like past precedent of humanity. Um, so that could be data entry, that could be legal precedent, that could be accounting, all of these different jobs, including coding. If I want a website, I don't have to hire a developer now. I can talk to ChatGPT and have it build me out a website and I, mm -hmm. it, it'll do all my marketing for me and set up any algorithms that I want to interface with stuff. It, it threatens a massive portion of so many sectors and industries within the job market. And it's going to do it better and faster and more accurately. So you can't necessarily make a justification if it works to then go and pay money to hire someone to do that work for you. So I think it, it's going to have to coincide with the conversation about universal basic income even if people don't necessarily necessarily believe in that, if we eliminate so many of these jobs all at once, you're going to have to have that conversation. But in a tightening environment where we're not even allowing businesses to take loans, you can't have that conversation currently. And at the same time, these companies, they want to control that AI um, infrastructure. They want to own it. Microsoft uh, bought ChatGPT because if they own it, then that's another service that they have and they can build their company and value exponentially. But it it's it's a very dangerous thing for them to have that because it's like the ultimate, it's like being dealt a hand of cards and you have four aces. Like it, it's going to be very difficult to contend with a trillion dollar valuation company with self-learning and compounding AI technology backing them. Yeah, I think you're... You make a good point there. I think what scares me the most is it kind of opens the door to a more more concentration of power. You know, people who work on AI, who control uh, the development of AI. Like, yeah, there's going to be more concentration of power. And yeah, we're you know, I'm not too worried about. Industries are going to evolve. Some will, you know, we don't make typewriters anymore, right? But yeah, it's the concentration of power, uh, how kind of like the, the the working person will probably be even more marginalized. That seems to be the trend, especially in the U.S., like the gap between the the rich and the poor. It just, it just grows. One last thing I want to add for anyone interested around the topic of AI tech or the shifting directions of the world. Um, Charles Hoskinson put out a video yesterday talking about the five pillars of the 21st century. So that covers AI technology, quantum or mm -hmm. supercomputing. Uh, it covers biotech, um, blockchain and uh, nanotechnology. So those five pillars of the 21st century that will shape humanity. Um, and he doesn't mince his words either when he speaks about it, that AI will either be the make or break that um, either ends or propels humanity. Um, that's how pivotal and disruptive that is because you now have a, an external brain thinking for you as an individual or an external brain of a company or an institution thinking for them. So it can very quickly exacerbate some of the problems that we have. Um, or it can help to solve them depending on who has access to it. So it's it's a really, I, I would recommend a, anyone that's interested in the topic, watch that video. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to check it out. Uh, yeah, Pixelato, you make a good point. The internet and things like that, they have led to, I guess, empowerment uh, of many, you know, of populations. But, uh, but yeah, I guess it it's a good good conversation to have. But I also see corporations like Google and Facebook gain more and more power. So 
Um, yeah, uh, we won't get into that now because we ran out of time. I'm going to watch this video and uh, enjoy the rest of my day. Hope you do that too, Viva. Thanks for coming on for the first full length macro musings. Uh, hopefully we can we can have another one soon and, and catch up on yeah, the market and and uh, we'll entertain the bulls, but uh, but we're focused on giving our honest opinions and um, yeah, focused on taking a realistic look at what's going on in the markets, crypto um, and the economy. So yeah, hit that like and subscribe if you want to see another episode. And uh, yeah, thanks again, Viva, for for coming on. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. You're an awesome host. Anyone else that's leaving comments, I mean, you probably see me out on Twitter. Don't hesitate to ask questions or go back and forth. And I'm happy to, if anyone has a counter opinion or an outlook, or you make a thread as to why the bull market's starting, I'll read it. And like I said, I, I hope that I'm wrong because it benefits uh, us in the short term, um, but I'm open to any information. So I appreciate everyone for coming together and learning. And uh, Thor, thank you so much.